Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Um, <clears throat> I recently moved to Brooklyn in New York, so instead of fancy computer slides, I have a Moleskine with handwritten notes in it. So I will be giving you a presentation uh, out of that. Um, also, because I use free software almost exclusively, my computer cannot work with any projector known to mankind. So Ori has been kind enough to lend me his la laptop to uh, have this nice little thing behind me. So. Um, yeah, okay, so I want to share with you today a project that I've been working on for the last 18 months or so, um, specifically in the API space, since we are at an API conference, and it is called uh, JSON API. Um, I, I must first admit, so this, this pretty much has three parts. Uh, first, the theory, the history, and then the practice of JSON API. But um, to get it up front, so the title of this was The Future of JSON API. I really, really, really wanted to tell you all that 1.0 was going to be happening right now. But like any software project, it never hits any deadlines that you set for yourself. So uh, last week, we had a meeting to be like, can we actually finalize 1.0? And there are one or two more nits. So in like two weeks, there's going to be a final uh, 1.0 release. Not today. I apologize. Um, OK, so a little bit about, uh, about me and why I care about this space and sort of the perspective of where I'm coming from. Um, I used to work on Ruby on Rails quite a bit um, and have done a lot of stuff in the Ruby world. Um, now I'm working for, I have a contract with Mozilla to work on their Rust programming language, so I've been doing that for the most recent uh, period of time. Um, but uh, I've been very interested in the hypermedia space for a long time, and I've been trying to convince Rubyists and Rails developers that the hypermedia is an interesting way to structure their APIs, and I've sort of been researching in the hypermedia space specifically for the last three or four years. Um, so that's sort of the background of where uh, I come from in this area. Um, so okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about Rails. Um, I know not everybody is a Ruby developer and does not know the details about Rails, but um, I want to talk a little bit about what Rails, Rails has done for APIs, because this project sort of comes directly from that. So we're in the, we're in the theory and background portion um, of JSON API. So I like to say that Rails has done the best and worst for REST ever basically, um, in terms of bringing the knowledge of what REST is to d web developers. Because while Rails did a great job of popularizing REST, as you probably know since you're at this conference, the REST that it popularized is not actually REST. Uh, and so what's interesting about that, that problem um, is that it did, it still was a very large leap forward for APIs in general. Um, I remember one of the things that's interesting about discussing the hypermedia space today is that lots of people say things like, hypermedia isn't practical, developers aren't going to want to deal with this extra complexity, there's all these kinds of other problems, and they directly echo sort of the 2002-2004 era of web development where people were saying, oh, web developers are not going to be able to understand anything more complicated than get and post. Um, there's no way they're ever going to use put and delete verbs. Um, you know, this is far too much. And now that's completely normal to us. Um, and so I see Rails as being very instrumental in moving the space of APIs forward, but it's also caused a lot of harm. Um, and so one of the, uh, if you're not familiar with Ruby on Rails, its greatest strength and why it was so popular is it popularized this idea called convention over configuration. And basically what that means is uh, there's generally a way to do something that's right 80 to 90% of the time, and so you should just assume that you're going to be doing that thing. So um, as an example, uh, at the time, a lot of the web frameworks had giant configuration files that told you, this is where your model classes will be, this is the directory where my controllers will be, this is the directory where my views are going to be. And Rails said, you know what? If you're not doing something really weird, you probably just have your models in a folder called models and your views in a folder called views. So let's just assume those are where those are and you don't need to manually configure them yourself. And that saves you the time of writing these giant files. Um, and all these other things. So this conven convention over configuration idea permeates all of Ruby on Rails. So uh, there were then code generators that would say, oh, if you need a model and controller and view, we're going to have this generator, and it's going to generate the default uh, CRUD actions for you. And since we need interactions for those CRUD actions, we're going to include the default HTTP semantics. So it will set up that post creates a new thing and that puts edits a new thing, even though that's a gigantic argument about updating versus replacing versus editing, whatever. That's very off topic. Um, but the point is it gave you these defaults, and it taught a lot of programmers about HTTP semantics they didn't care about before. Because if you'd move from your like bespoke, handcrafted, uh, I was doing PHP at the time, so I would use PHP, although it's not specific to that, um, where you could do whatever you want to these Rails defaults, you have to learn about these HTTP semantics that Rails is now introducing you to, because you're going to get them whether or not you like them.
like them because they're the defaults. Um, the other big thing that Rails did with convention over configuration that was wonderful and terrible is the relationship of the database to your URL structure and the APIs that you expose. So again, like if you have a blog and you have posts on that blog, you probably have a URL with slash posts. And you probably have a post one in your database because that would be the first auto incremented ID. And so you probably have a slash post slash one URL. But unfortunately, what this means is you're basically exposing your database schema over HTTP. And um, as we know from software development uh, practices, directly coupling the internal implementation details of your system to external users leads to tons of fragility and tons of like brokenness. You can't change things anymore because your external customers depend on your internal details. And that is bad generally speaking, and not that software engineering is like a very you know, well-developed field. Um, you know, all the things that we're doing with computers are basically new, right? When I look, especially, um, one of the things I love about visiting Europe is that like, most of the buildings in this city are older than my country even is, right? So like, when I talk about an old building, it's like, oh, that building's 100 years old. It's, like, it's getting up there, right? But like, here, we have all these things that have lasted much longer. And that's the way that I feel about software development, too, is that like, we are all children in the earliest stages of a field. Um, that does not really know what it's doing whatsoever. So I don't, I don't think that's a negative thing, it's just truth. That's, that's the way it is. So we're all figuring it out. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so as part of this issue with this, this coupling between your internals and your customers, and this is also fundamental to APIs in general, right? So in some ways, like software coupling is talking about two uh, things in a software system, but if you just add a network boundary into the middle, you basically get the same thing as what your API is. Um, you know, it's just discussing things over network boundary instead of discussing things over an FFI boundary or like, you know, an intra-language boundary. And so ultimately APIs are about communication between two different people. And as you saw in Marcus's presentation, we can be using the exact same words, but you can have no idea what I'm saying. Right, because the thing that I'm trying to communicate to you, I need to like bridge this gap from me to you, get the idea that's in my head out of my head across the air and into yours so you understand what's going on. Um, and so the, we call those things that happen, like the, the air gap between my brain and your gain, brain, we call that a protocol, right? That's how we bridge this gap and communicate with another entity. And we do that, I'm doing that right now with you in MeetSpace, but like that's what computers are doing uh, you know, as well. We, I'm using this protocol called English because it's the lowest common denominator in the room, right? Unfortunately, I don't know any French and I'm very embarrassed about it um, because lots of the books that I read are originally in French, um, so that's a bummer. Uh, but we choose the protocol that will allow for the most communication, right? So in this case, we're using English. Um, and in the web, this happens with HTTP, right? It's not necessarily good for everything, but we use it for everything anyway. Uh, okay. And so uh, good software design and good API design is all about uh, interfaces and practices and communication. Okay. So... That's the sort of the background um, of that portion of things. One of the problems with this then, um, we talk about the schema.org, for example, um, in Marcus's presentation is about creating a shared communication model. And so this means that when you create unique individual snowflake, uh, bespoke, hipster, uh, models of communication, uh, they're really cool because only a few people know about them, but they're not useful because only a few people know about them. You, when you're trying to communicate with other people, you want to communicate with as many as possible, probably, I'm assuming, um, or at least in the space we're talking about with like building companies, right? You don't want to limit your customer base. You want as many customers as possible. And so um, the problem with creating handcrafted individual APIs is that we're limited. So I have to recreate a new client for every single API that happens because the current state of the art in APIs is to create a unique, bespoke, handcrafted API that does exactly what you know, your company wants it to be. But because we have no shared communication, we can't build these generic systems that allow my one client to talk to multiple APIs. And what this ends up meaning um, is that we end up recreating and building more work for ourselves. Um, you know, I make choices that make you do more work, and then you make choices that make you do more work, and then you make choices that make you do more work, and then they make choices that make me do more work, and it just all goes around and we all bill our hours, right? That's just like how things work. Um, but I would like to imagine a future where we build something like an API client once, and then we just use it with more and more and more APIs, and I don't have to keep building new API clients all the time, every single time, with every single API that comes out. Um, 
And so while mass-produced APIs may not be cool as bespoke APIs, or at least not rebuilding them all over this place. And so this is sort of the, like one of the tensions that's happening in the API industry right now. And as you can see with the, you know, Marcus's presentation and then mine, we're all trying to come up with these different ways um, of doing these shared communication methods. Um, and so that's often happening in the media type design space. So especially in the hypermedia world, we love media types and that kind of theory. I won't get into the details, but basically media type is just a, a rules for processing a document of information and making some kind of sense out of it. And so what JSON API is, it's specifically a media type for building um, your APIs in JSON. Now, naming your project is always the most hard part of any project, right? And so what's funny is I, when we were trying to come up with a name for this thing, I was like, no one's using JSON API just in the generic sense yet, so let's just use it. And so a lot of people got very mad at me on the internet when I said that my standard was called JSON API because they were like, how dare you use the generic name that we all use for your specific format? And so I responded by making our logo not actually valid JSON for fun. So it, it like, it, it looks... <laughs> My favorite part about the standard, actually, is that, like, so we had the version of the logo with the quotes, and I was like, something just doesn't look right. And we took the quotes out, and we're like, that's much more pretty. And I thought that would just be really hilarious to, to make it not actually JSON. So, oh well. Uh, they're just bare words instead of strings. Um, so that's a, that's a funny little Easter egg um, in the spec. Um, but basically, the idea is that if we continue to use these standards, and, and I don't care so much specifically about which standard you particularly choose, um, I don't think that there will be one media type to rule them all in APIs. I think that where we'll end up with is four or five different types, or a, a small number. One of the things about computer science, right, there's the rule that like you can have zero of something, one of something, or as many somethings as you like. So we are not conditioned to think that like four or five of a thing is acceptable. I don't know about you, but it makes me anxious. I feel like I should either be unifying it into one grand unit unified version of everything, or that there should be an infinite number of things. And so like a small number is, is a hard thing to do. Um, but I think that's where we're going to end up in the API space, with a small number of these shared vocabularies that have different strengths. So um, that's always my answer. Mike Kelly, the author of the HAL specification, that's usually what I end up spending, saying, saying to him about his spec, is that like, our specs are similar, but they have slightly different strengths. And if, if you want your strengths, use yours. Uh, we, we argue a lot, and I really enjoy it. We have a really good like working relationship. Um, and so I think that there, is, there does not need to be an intense amount of competition between these different standards. And I don't particularly care which one you choose, although of course mine is best, clearly. Um, <laughs> at least for my constraints and the things that I'm building. Um, okay, uh, so that's sort of the, the rest of the, the end of the theory portions. Let me talk to you about the history um, here. Um, so. I've seen Rails developers do almost the same things, but then build their own custom APIs on top of following what Rails' defaults are. And also, Rails' defaults, while they're good, are not exactly well thought out from a like, theory perspective. They're kind of just like whatever people decided to add. Um, with a little bit of theory, some people corrected some things, but you know, there's some stuff that's just there because it's there, right? Vestigial appendages that happen. Um, and so, uh, Yehuda Katz is someone that I have been lucky enough to call a friend. Um, he has built the, most recently, the Ember JavaScript framework. And uh, one of the really cool things about the new like JavaScript standard heavy world is that we're sort of building our own custom API clients. We're just doing them all in JavaScript in the browser instead of you know, on the desktop with real quote unquote programming languages or whatever. Um, I don't think JavaScript is as bad as everybody says it is, but that's a totally different presentation, so I will just leave it at that. Um, but Yehuda was building Ember, and so one of his problems is he's, he's like, we need a server-side component for Ember um, applications, but I don't want to tie it to one particular programming language, um, because it's not really fair uh, to like, say that if, you, if Ember could only be used with Rails as a backend, then no one, well not no one, but not as many people would use Ember. And so, uh, and it's not about arguing over whose programming language is better, we all want choice in our tooling. And so he was trying to come up with a way to figure out how to get Ember apps to talk to any particular backend. And so I was like, media types, this is the answer. And so after a long campaign and tons of discussing, um, we came up with this idea to sort of take what Ember desired and what Rails put out figure out the details that didn't actually work because they're like 90% the same but a little bit of difference, and then standardize it as a specification that's language agnostic. So while this spec came out of the sort of Ember plus Rails uh, world, it's specifically not for Ember and not for Rails. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about other deployments of this in a minute, but that was kind of the idea is that we're bridging this gap between the client and the server side 
for building these kinds of applications um, and, and doing it by standardizing the semantics and structure of the JSON in the middle. Because as long as anything can spit out JSON API, then any Ember application can read that, that backend regardless of what language is written in, and vice versa if other JavaScript frameworks were to adopt this as their um, spec. Some people have been doing things at Backbone. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so this is sort of the general idea um, of how this goes. <clears throat> Actually, let's talk about that uh, aspect right now. So um, I, until very recently, worked for a company called Balance Payments in San Francisco, and we did payments for marketplaces. And um, they are a Python shop um, on the back end, but they were also using Ember, and so they chose the JSON API spec for their API for everything. And so we actually have a live, real deployment of JSON API that's doing over a million dollars a day in transa financial transactions. And so. When people ask, like, is your spec baked enough, or is it good enough, or can it handle my use case, I say, like, a million dollars a day in transactions, are you doing more than that? Maybe you should reconsider, but if it's less than that, then, you know, we're good, we have a production deployment doing that. Um, and so they've found lots of interoperability and, and, um, and, uh, in being able to do that. Another thing that I like about having a shared specification and something that we found useful in that instance um, is also similar to the problem that consulting agencies face that build APIs. So if you work for a consultancy and you're building APIs for your clients on a regular basis, you find yourself, you know, sometimes like consultancies feel very much like Groundhog Day. If you work as a consultant, you're like doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And so if you're building APIs over and over and over and over again, you know that that's just a new, fresh chance to argue over HTTP semantics with your entire team for a couple weeks before you deploy something, right? Um, programmers love bike sheds. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Google image search this real quick, because this is my favorite, my favorite demonstration of the bike shedding principle, is if you uh, images, oh, this is totally in the wrong format, never mind. I'm just, my inner computer doesn't work. The keys look like they're in the right place, but they're not. Okay. So I was, I was preparing, I was preparing a, a different presentation. The bike shedding principle, as far as I'm concerned, is like a law of physics. It's actually called Parkinson's law of triviality. Um, and so I think it should be taught like in physics classes because it is a fundamental rule of the universe. Um, but if you, if you Google image search for bike shed, I was doing a presentation and I was like, I'm gonna put a picture of a bike shed. So I typed it in and I looked at the first result and I said, that doesn't look like a bike shed. And then I went, oh, damn it. Like, I'm doing the same thing, right? Like, I'm arguing about what a bike shed looks like from the Google result for bike shedding. Um, and so, uh, one of the ways that I've been explaining that, like, why you should choose a media type, in my case, JSON API in particular, but also any of the other various media type standards, um, is that when you have a web page that describes the HTTP semantics and structure of your JSON, you can't waste two weeks of development time arguing about whether you should use camel case or underscores in your identifiers, or whether or not you should be namespacing your model data, or whether or not you know, posting this URL should or should not collect, create, whatever. Like, by, by building these kinds of shared understandings, we can stop ourselves from having those admittedly fun, I too love arguing minutia and playing like language lawyer um, about details, but it's a waste of everyone's time. And so we could actually be building useful things instead of arguing with each other if we just like sucked it up a little bit and like picked you know, a thing and then just did it. Um, and so uh, I've actually found some uptake in consulting companies with JSON API because when you have this shared tooling, you can just build similar APIs over and over and over again and not need to have those arguments constantly about what different things should be. And so uh, that's actually my, my most succinct description of JSON API is just the anti-bike shedding uh, weapon. Um, I believe since we're off schedule, I'm not 100% sure, I guess I still have about 10 minutes, so I wanna show you a little bit about the details since this is the, the background. Oh, I guess so the, the future of things. So um, this, I've been working on this spec for about 18 months now. Um, like I said, we have a number of production deployments that are in existence, and those production deployments have been invaluable. Um, one of the reasons why uh, I like the specification and sort of my approach to things is that um, I don't like to, I don't like the go off and imagine what the most beautiful, perfect, possible clean room implementation of things could be, and then pick things on that. Um, I like to take what actually exists and then improve it towards the direction that I like to improve things. So if I were to design a specification from absolutely nothing with no design constraints, this is not actually the specification that I would design. But the thing is, is that no one would use that specification. Um, because this spec is built on the foundation of thousands of deployed Rails applications for the most of its semantics, um, 
it comes across as something that is much more familiar to you if you have not dealt with, um, hypermedia is optional in JSON API actually. Um, we encourage you to use it, but you're not required as a path of getting people down um, the line towards you know, where I think APIs should be. But um, so, so it's sort of built on, even though the spec is not totally 100% finished, it is 99.999% finished, and it's been uh, about a year and a half of work. Um, in many ways, it's sort of built on these pillars of these deployed applications that have existed already, and so there's not actually that much that is um, new and exciting. Um, in the sense that like, it should feel, that one of the goals, my explicit goal with the specification was to make it feel familiar to you. Um, and then add a little bit of semantics on top and or clear off some of the areas that are a little bit um, questionable. Um, or that where you might have an argument where there's sort of like you do it one way or the other and both ways are kind of valid, so you just kind of kind of pick one, we like picked one. Um, so uh, let me briefly show you, so this is the website right now. One of the things I want to do that I've not done yet is create a like, much more friendly uh, introduction. And so this is much more in the, the genre of like uh, RFC 2119, which I love, but other people kind of find intimidating, is these must, must not, required, shall. Oh, this is a little down a little far. Right, so once you start seeing these words in capital letters, you're like, oh no, I'm reading a specification, right? <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> While we have this specification, I want a sort of gentler, nicer introduction, but I have not yet written it. Um, but basically, in the, in the very simple case, um, here is a, an example. Uh, so we use a blog post, for example, again, in the Rails tradition of like everything is a blog. Um, one of my favorite, so he mentioned, uh, <laughs> many mentioned Hacker News. One of my favorite comments on Hacker News was actually at DHH, the creative Ruby on Rails. Uh, when one of the Rails releases came out, he, uh, he's like, he, then the blog post got linked the, uh, someone commented on Hacker News, they're like, oh, uh, isn't this blog like really old? Like you haven't really changed this blog since Rails was originally made. And he's like, oh yeah, it's running Rails like 0 0.8. I just really haven't had the time to like write a new one. And I'm like, come on, David, it should only take you 15 minutes, right? <laughs> eh? And he just like didn't answer, just no response. So that's fun. Um, he's another person I have a good working relationship with. Anyway, so, uh, so this is the sort of the ultimate basics is that we require you to namespace. So if there is one blog post, you put it under a key posts and you show um, ID one. Um, and so we have very few reserved words. So ID being the um, identifier. And if you have multiples, you return an array of multiple elements. Um, where it starts getting a little um, intense and cool is you can include hrefs. So um, for example, here are the list of comments for this blog post. And so uh, we allow you to put in an href to fetch those if you don't want to include them inline, et cetera. Anyway, I have a whole pile more specifications. I don't want to bore you with like literally reading a spec. But um, the, uh, we've built this on top of a number of other standards, including JSON patch um, and the patch um, RFC for HTTP patch um, and uh, URL templates and like all these other things that are relatively familiar. Um, so, oh, this scrolls the wrong way now. Um, so yeah, we have big giant format documents. Um, as far as like actual libraries, because again, uh, the point is not that I want each of you to go re-implement the specification, right? I want like one of you to be the sacrificial lamb to re-implement the specification, and then everyone else can just use the fruits of their labor. Um, we have uh, pre-built clients in JavaScript and iOS, PHP and Node and Ruby and Python. Um, eventually, I will build a Rust one once that's more standard, uh, and you know, Go and even .NET. Um, and so the idea, my hope, is that instead of you implementing this directly, you can just go use one of these pre-built clients, and that will help guide you towards both generating your server and your clients um, as far as the spec goes. Um, all right, so uh, I think that's pretty much all that I have for you right now. Um, yes, yeah, so stop building custom, super custom APIs. Check out the different formats that we've all been developing and showing you. Pick one of them and just use it. Build shared tooling and stop wasting everyone's time. Let's build cool stuff to do neat things. Thank you. Great call. So, who, wanted first, who wants to, uh, to ask the first question? No. Oh, no, it was just a scratch. Yeah, there. You can make them run the whole way to the back. <laughs> I need to lose, to lose some weight, right? Yeah. You should, you should uh, get more people to help you with this conference. You have microphone holders. Hi, nice talk. Thank um, you. We've been using JSON API for over a year now. Um, we we're really excited about 1.0 release so we can ship uh, stable. Awesome. Um, uh, what 
uh, you don't treat in or don't talk about in JSON API is uh, stuff that every JSON every JSON API needs, like versioning, yeah. throttling, authentication. And I, I know your point of view, but you might want to share it with the community. Totally. So uh, I guess there was a microphone, so I don't need to repeat the question. Um, Basically, so one of the things that uh, both Yehuda and I, so it, the, the three like masters of the spec are me, Yehuda, and Dan Gebhardt. Um, we recently added a third person as co-maintainer of the spec. Because you know when you have two people, then you can get into stalemates, so we got three now. Um, but uh, what we want to do is we want to have a small core of the specification and then allow people to build on top of it and then eventually pull those things into core when there's consensus. So the one example that's very, very common is pagination. So we actually do not have pagination in the specification right now, but we do have ways that you can add pagination um, to the spec. Like there's room for the specification for you to layer pagination on top. And then we plan on like talking to our user base and seeing how people are actually using these things like pagination, and then going from there, again, with this idea of taking production deployed applications and extracting the best things out of them, rather than me going, hmm, pagination, how should that work, and then making you all do whatever thing I dreamed up. Admittedly, a fun thing to think about on like a Sunday afternoon, but not a way to get people to actually build things. Um, and so yes, we are missing, there are definitely things that are missing. The, uh, the 1.0 specification will not be a thing that... Uh, does not add stuff later. Um, while we will never break backwards compatibility, we will be adding new things for sure. Um, and stuff like that is, is absolutely definitely needed. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we got the core right first and then move on to those things. Yeah, second question. We will have a, a short but good panel at the end for, uh, for other questions. So it will be, it will be the last one for, for now. Uh, great talk, first Thank of you. all. And thinking about use case, for example, of having a client app to register for workshops on different events, like API Day, say API, uh, what was the other one? Uh, there is no other one. Strategy. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> .js and, and uh, you know, there's like JS Fest, there's lots of events. I would like to have an API that on those websites I register for events. Mm -hmm. So Marcos was talking about shared understanding, that you can have understanding like a session or workshop and, and register affordance. Sure. Uh, do you work in any way with this shared understanding of a kind of models or concept? Uh, or do you see a way to do something like that without the shared understanding? So, um, I uh, I never know the right way to put this, but basically I I have beef with the concept of the semantic web and ontologies in general, and so I don't personally enjoy trying to do that kind of thing and go down that path. Other people do, and I am happy that they are doing something that makes them happy. Um, so. There's sort of this like, there's like two ways you can tackle this problem. And one is creating ontologies of understanding and then going from there. And the other way is like acknowledging that those ontologies are always fundamentally broken because tree-like structures cannot properly replicate the complexity of the actual way that we use language and understanding and words and concepts. And then we get into like all sorts of, mostly French guys that I read actually, uh, but it is very off topic for this conference. So. Uh, I will say that we're not interested in going in the semantic web direction, but I do know that there are some people that are like using JSON-LD stuff on top of JSON API because we don't actually conflict, and so you can use them together, which is also an interesting like next level kind of thing too, is mixing and matching these things together. Um, I'm taking more of the like uh, link relations is an opaque key, and we agree that means something, and I'm not, I don't care about creating a hierarchy of link relations and stuff. I want them to just grow independently. Um, if that makes any sense, so. So let's keep the last question for the panels. Thank you, Steve, thank you very much. Thank you.